David, thank you. This is probably the worst lineup to have to follow David Mitchell. And you're an amazing storyteller and brings to a lot of us a lot of the personal connection with the issues we're facing today. I'd like to thank Reed and the National Academies for the invitation to be here. Fascia Cures, as many of you know, is the center of the Milken Institute and has had a unique mission, and that mission has transcended any one disease area or any one treatment. So our mission has been to build a system that is efficient, effective, and driven by a clear goal. The patient needs should surpass every other need in the system. And then it's our belief that transformative science should be fully realized and that deliver better treatments to the people who need them. So access and affordability remain top concerns for every player in the system, and as David Mitchell has pointed out, for virtually everyone in this room and for every family member. So Fasta Cruz has worked with Avalier Health, and a 23-person multi-stakeholder group, and many of you are probably around this room. Um, a few years ago, we published and issued a report called Patient Perspectives for Value. And unsurprisingly, patient and family costs were an important component of the considerations around value. So in addition to the cost of interventions, patients and families were also very focused on out-of-pocket, cost avoidance, and non-medical costs, such as transportation or time away. So I wanted just to reflect that the cost of the system and affordability is very much in line with how we view a system that has to deliver a benefit for all. So over the past few years, past year, since I've only been at Fast Research for 18 months, this past January we launched two research efforts that might be relevant to this discussion. And so the first is a focus on advancing a high-performing system. So for 15 years, Faster Cures has been motivated by the reality that despite an enormous amount of effort across a global community, we're still left with wide gaps in the number of people who suffer from diseases worldwide and the treatments available to help them. And I believe my good colleague, Chris Austin, shared with you both the opportunities that exist for science to treat rare disease, but also common conditions. And he also shared with you the picture of the complexity and the wide range of actors that must be engaged in the process. Hopefully he showed you the 4D, yes. Yes, every time I see that, my eyes begin to water. <laughs> so last year, we asked ourselves a series of basic questions. How do we know when and if the system is working optimally for patients? Where are the bottlenecks, and where are there incentives that are misaligned? And to no surprise, what we found is that there are no commonly used metrics for holistically measuring the performance of the system from end to end. In fact, that we call it for a system for simplicity. But the definition of a system is one in which, according to Merriam-Webster, there are actors who, quote, regularly interact or are interdependent on one another and form a unified whole. And when you consider system performance, implicit in this is having clear, shared, and common goals that unify actors. I think we can all safely say we're quite far from having a system. So after exploring this idea for the past year and hoping that somebody would say, this is a terrible idea, but they didn't, Faster Cure has initiated this past spring a project to first work with a multi-stakeholder group to define and clarify the goals of an ideal system, ide identify existing indicators and in ways that others have measured the progress of the system, specific processes, or the performance of specific actors that can be built upon for our purposes and also work with multi-stakeholder groups to identify, modify, or create metrics that get to the heart of measuring how well the biomedical innovation system is performing for patients. And while on this journey to confirming the merit and the relevance of this endeavor, we discovered partners who share our interests at HHS and have benefited from the engagement of federal officials across various agencies, including my friends at NIH, FDA, CMS, and ARC, and many of you in this room. So what's been accomplished in the last, actually, four months? Fascia Cures held a workshop in February, so a little longer, to develop a shared vision statement. The assembled group of 30-plus individuals articulated this working vision for the work, that a high-performing system should be a learning healthcare system that improves health outcomes for all. And as a starting point, workshop participants recommended that the initial focus of the work should be providing data on the state of the system, rather than the work being focused on driving accountability or informing resource allocation, and that the primary audience for this initial work be policymakers, even though we believe the output of this work would have general interest to a broader audience. We've also partnered with Rand Europe, who is an established track record for focusing on measuring the impact of research and system level evaluation. 
Based on their review of existing frameworks, domains, and indicators, we recently held a workshop just this week with a multi-stakeholder group to discuss potential domains of the scorecard. We'll be releasing the results of the RAND review and the output of the workshop this fall. But as a preview, the domains that rose to the top of the group included areas that they believe should be a focus for achieving the stated vision. And they are collaboration and transparency, efficiency, market environment, patient centricity, equitable access and use, innovation and productivity and capacity. So for any of you that are interested in this project, either in this room or, or on the web, please contact me um, and become engaged with us. Finally, we've had an opportunity to look down the field to the new players who are entering the system and their desire and urgency to see faster progress in areas that tend to be overlooked by traditional actors. In May, we launched a new incubator project in partnership with our Center for Financial Markets and their experts focus on innovative financing. The goal of our work will be to support the formation, the scale, and the partnership of new actors in the system who are capable of catalyzing a new pipeline of medical treatments by advancing new business models and financing models for drug development. What we found to date are a range of emerging organizations. They include mission-oriented companies. For example, a new crop of drug companies are incorporated as public benefit corporations, B Corps, where societal benefit is baked into these companies' charters and that they are putting patient affordability at the core of their mission. An example of this is Paradigm Shift Therapeutics, which is an immuno-oncology company founded with a mission to develop affordable breakthrough cancer therapies. They've been funded by Avon Foundation for Women, and a collaboration with the NIH helps them create a public-private partnership for cost-effective sharing of research capabilities, expertise, and state-of-the-art infrastructure. And just recently, we met with Audacity Therapeutics, who are looking to repurpose AZT and other AIDS drugs for multiple cirrhosis. Repurposing drugs, as you all talked about yesterday, that have no longer have IP is an area that, may have, that you've talked about and one where there is really no incentive for traditional actors. Second are the growing ranks of nonprofit drug developers. The role of nonprofits in drug development continues to expand. One prominent example we are watching very closely is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Medical Research Institute. They describe themselves as a nonprofit biotech whose focus includes malaria, TB, and diarrheal disease. Their goal is to improve outcomes in maternal and child health in lower and middle income countries. And nonprofit groups are also financing medical product development through their venture arms. Notable examples are the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Fund, Cure Duchenne's, and the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation's T1D Fund. Although the total amount of these groups may that these groups may spend is dwarfed by the role of traditional sources of capital. Other disease groups are beginning to look at these venture models and the engagement of these groups is often earlier and in areas of higher risk than where traditional investors are willing to tolerate. And last but not least, you may have seen an announcement by Clover Health, the Medicare Advantage Plan, who has launched a drug development arm, Clover Therapeutics, in partnership with many biopharmas. The role of these new actors is critical when you consider that there are often prevalent diseases, diseases that we have today that lack a pipeline. Rare diseases are often discussed, and we've talked about antibiotics, but according to industry analysis, venture capital funding is at an all-time low for chronic disease, including areas like depression and type 2 diabetes. And finally, large biopharma companies are critical partners to these new actors. For example, just this past month, the Gates MRI announced a collaboration with Spiro Therapeutics for an exclusive licensing de deal to develop, manufacture, and commercialize one of their assets for the treatment of tuberculosis in low- and middle-income countries. Also, there's always been a focus on the opportunity that exists to more quickly advance development programs that may be underfunded or deprioritized within large biopharma companies. There are a range of reasons that companies may deprioritize certain programs, including uncertainty about the science or a strategic fit within the rest of their portfolio. But what we're seeing now is increasingly the factor that commercial potential of a program is playing a greater and greater role in these investment decisions. In fact, an ENY survey last year of life science executives found that 80% of the executives cited uncertainty and reimbursement as the reason that they are trimming their pipelines. Therefore, the relationships between the emerging actors and these companies will only continue to be more critical. So my takeaway for us this morning is we're at a high watermark for philanthropic assets. 
The talent for medical product development no longer resides in just one sector, and the desire exists to take much bigger leaps. We have to have a system that brings all these actors and the traditional actors together with shared goals and aligned incentives, and it's critical for us to understand and cultivate the potential of new actors and partnerships, especially when we face growing public health threats and where competition can lead to lower prices. Thank you.